and we're good to go. Everything. Excellent. Well, as you can hopefully see from the screen, I am Nicola Phillipson. I am a barrister at Park Lane Cloud and Chambers in Leeds and I specialise in probate and inheritance matters with a side order of trusts. Um, I'm Nicola Phillipson, TEP, and the TEP after my name means that I pass exams and I'm a member of STEP, which is the Society of Trust and Estates Practitioners. Um, that particular bit isn't actually remotely relevant for the talk, um, but people always ask me, what's a TEP? What does it stand for? So I thought I'd address it at the outset so you weren't all sitting there thinking, gosh, this is a really interesting talk about dead bodies and who has control of them. But what I really want to know is what does TEP stand for? So there you go. And whilst I'm talking about the legal jargon, because I know that I'm dealing with people here who are lawyers, but also people who are not lawyers, um, when I say I am a probate practitioner, I'm using the word probate in a completely non-legal, non-technical sense. And what I really mean is that I deal with all the stuff um, that happens when and after people die. And uh, sometimes before as well, because I have actually had someone challenge a will before the testator was dead. Um, which was interesting, but there you go. Um, and that work includes challenging a will, disputing what is in an estate, arguing over what happens in the event of intestacy, whether somebody's a child or not a child, which raises its head far more frequently than you would think, and also disputes in relation to what should happen to bodies after death. And it is this last issue which I am talking to you about today. Now, if you want a more in-depth consideration of the statutes, the CPR, the relevant case law for the lawyers, or a proper legal run through of what to do and how to do it for the sake of a non-lawyers, then I can point you in the direction of. Next slide, please. Go Yay, an excellent book called A Practical Guide to the Law in Relation to Control of the Body After Death, um, which is available from Law Brief or from Amazon. And I have to say, it was worth writing the book just so that my children could be amazed and gobsmacked at the fact that they can order me on Amazon. Um, now, I'm not saying that this is an excellent book just to plug my book. It is actually a genuine signpost to where you can get some more in-depth legal technical help because I've got 20 minutes in this particular seminar to talk and what I'm giving you is an overview of the subject. I also say at this point that nothing I say in this talk should be taken to be legal advice. Um, for the non-lawyers in you, if you are, and amongst you, if you have a dispute over a body or over any other form of probate, then I would always advise that you seek proper professional help for your proper personalised individual dispute or advise the people that you're talking to to do that. I'd obviously say that you need to go to a lawyer, but Julia, I think, will give you some more alternatives. So that's the introduction, who I am, the disclaimer that you can't rely on anything I say, have said, or about to say for the next 15 minutes, and I'll turn to the talk itself. Now, the important thing to remember when you're looking at um, a body is that there is no right of ownership in a dead body. Nobody owns a body. Nobody can say, that's mine, and therefore I get to decide what to do with it. But what there is, is at common law, there is a duty to arrange for the proper disposal of a body. And the person who has the duty is the person who can call for the body to fulfill that duty. So when you have a body and you have a dispute over it, the first question that you need to ask is who has the duty to dispose of that body? Essentially, whose job is it? And the answer to that question is, next slide please, it depends. Um, it all depends. As is the case with so many probate disputes, everyone's life is a lot easier if you have a will. And where you have a valid will, and when I talk about a will in this talk for the next 15-20 minutes, I am talking about a valid will. Um, if you want to challenge the will, and therefore you want to challenge the status of the executor, it gets a lot more complicated, it's an entirely different talk, and you need to go and see a solicitor. Um, so for the purposes of this talk, I am going to assume that all wills are valid. And if you have a valid will, the person with the duty to dispose of the body is the executor or executors named in the will. And it's that straightforward. They're named. The will usually helpfully gives their addresses and so you can find them. And because an executor gets their power to act from the existence of the will, the right to call for the body exists 
from the moment of death. They're in charge. If you want to challenge what, you're, what they're doing, you will need to challenge their status as executor, which I will deal with later. But where you have a valid will, it's as straightforward as that. Somebody dies, they name Julia as the executor. Julia gets to say what happens. Where you don't have a will, things get more complicated. Um, for the non-lawyers about you, um, or amongst you, although people generally use the term executors and grants of probate to talk about all things to do with wills and probate, in fact, executors only exist where you actually have a will. Where you have an intestacy, you have administrators and they get letters of administration. And where the person then, so where you have an intestacy, and somebody has applied to the court for letters of administration, and they have letters, they have the same rights as an executor. They immediately have the right to do, um, and the duty to dispose of the body. Because they have that duty, they have the power to call for the body. Um, now, for those of you who are paying attention, you'll have noticed that I said an administrator has the power once they have their letters. Um, unlike an executor who gets their power from the will and gets it immediately, an administrator doesn't have any power um, or any duty until they get their letters. And as you probably know, or you can probably guess, it can take weeks, if not months, to get your letters of administration. So in fact, when you are dealing with an intestacy, it is very rare, and if you have a body or a funeral dispute, that you are dealing with an administrator with letters, and therefore an administrator who has an actual duty and therefore actual right. And the difference it can be um, seen if you need, for example, an injunction to call for a body. An executor can issue an injunction to call for a body because they have the power immediately. An administrator cannot. They would need, first of all, the permission of the court because they don't have the power um, to immediately call for the body. So where you have an intestacy but no letters, we move on to, oh, I would say number three, but clearly the slide is 111. The third number one. Where you have an intestacy but no letters, the person who um, has the duty will be the person with the highest right to take out the letters as set out in section 46 of the Administration of Estates, that's 1925, and rule 22.1 of the Non-Contentious Probate Rules. And if we go to next slide, please, you will see them there. So I've set them out for you just so you can see them. Um, and I do like to think, that J.K. Rowling was reading the non-contentious probate rules when she wrote Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince. Um, but you can see there, we're pretty much always dealing with people who died after the 1st of January 1926, and it's the surviving spouse, the partner, children of the deceased, or the issue of any deceased child, father and mother of the deceased, brothers and sisters of the whole blood, um, and then we move to brothers and sisters of the half-blood. But essentially, the order goes like this. Spouses or civil partners, children, parents, siblings and it's in that order now one thing you may have noticed in this list is it does not contain the words next of kin there is no such thing for the purposes of the law around probate and inheritance it also does not contain the words common law wife or common law husband for exactly the same reason just as a long-term partner or cohabitee does not have the right to inherit under intestacy, so they have no right to apply for letters of administration. If they have no right to apply for letters of administration, they do not have a duty to dispose of the body. If they do not have a duty to dispose of the body, they do not have a right to call for the body and they do not have a right to say what should happen. And essentially, you fall into this list that you can see on the screen, or you don't. And if you do fall into this list, your right to the letters, and therefore your right to claim the duty and the power, depends upon where in the list you are. The higher up the list you are, the greater your right. Basically think of it as a game of trumps or top trumps or poker. You know, spouse beats child who beats parents, etc., etc. So now you know who has the duty and therefore who has the right to make the decisions. It's the executor or the person at the top of your list, assuming you don't have power um, through your letters of administration. What do you do in the event that you want to challenge the decision of the person with the power? Or 
what do you do if in fact your dispute is between people with equal rights to the power? And most commonly there, you are looking at parents of children of the deceased or children of the deceased. Because of course, if you don't have a will and you're looking at an intestacy here, um, you can see there that if there's no surviving spouse or civil partner, the next piece are the children. Well, if mum dies and she's um, got no surviving spouse or civil partner and she's got three children and those three children all disagree as to how she should be buried or where she should be buried or whether she should be cremated or what should happen at the funeral, you can't say, well, the eldest trumps. It doesn't work like that. They're all three children, assuming they're all three um, um, biological children, there's no stepchildren in there, they have equal rights and therefore you can't just go to the hierarchy. In those circumstances you have two choices. Um, the first is that you talk and you reach agreement as to the way forward and this is where Julia's talk um, will come into its own. Or secondly you go to court to get an order to decide who should have the power because the court has the ability to say that somebody else should have the right and therefore the power. Essentially, the court can overrule your top trump. Now, I'm not going into how you actually go ahead and do that. Um, that again is another 20 minute talk on its own, but you know, you've seen um, that there is a book that will enable you to do that. Um, for the lawyers and amongst you, it's an application either under section 50 of the Administration of Justice Act 1985 or section 116 of the Senior Courts Act 1981, depending upon whether you're dealing with executors or administrators. And there are cases um, which will help you um, look at what the court has decided in the past. But in reality, the basis upon which the court will exercise its discretion when it decides who should get the grant will vary from case to case. The decision is very fact specific. However, what you can take away from the cases are that where there is one person who has the right, so one named executor on a will or one surviving spouse, the court will generally not interfere. The way it works, so if you have, as I said, two children who are arguing, but you have a surviving spouse, that surviving spouse will generally be given the right. If, however, there is more than one person who have equal rights, so you don't have somebody who has that top trump card, it will give the power to one person and it will consider the deceased's wishes, the reasonable requirements and wishes of the family who are left to grieve. In the event of a dispute over location, they will consider the location with which the deceased was most closely connected. And perhaps most importantly, they will consider that the body be disposed of with all proper respect and decency and if possible, without any further delay. And I forgot to say, next slide, please, because you can see those up on the screen there. They're the four criteria which the court will look at um, when they decide between two competing people. And it is important um, that if you are looking at a dispute like this, that they are the four factors that you need to consider because they are the four factors that the court will look at. Um, if you do go down the court route, you will clearly need to issue court proceedings and there will then be a hearing. Um, that hearing will inevitably take time to organise. And the most important, well, not the most important, but a very important thing to remember is that the person who loses will usually be ordered to pay the costs. Costs follow the event. This is litigious litigation. Um, the estate does not generally bear the costs. It will be the individual who challenges and the individual who loses, which, of course, is why Julia will tell you uh, that mediation and settlement is much the best way forward. Um, I'm not going to say anything further. Uh, there are cases that can and should mediate. There are cases which clearly can't settle that way and which have to go to court. But I will say, certainly to the non-lawyers amongst you, if you do go down the legal route, I strongly advise you to find yourself a lawyer. Again, because you need to concentrate on these four matters, the court will not get involved in making actual decisions. The court will not decide whether the deceased should be buried, or whether the deceased should be cremated, whether it should be roses on the um, coffin or whether it should be carnations. What the court will do is they will decide who has the power to make those decisions. They won't make the decisions themselves. So they shall say, Julia wants carnations, Nikki wants um, roses. The court doesn't care whether it's carnations or, or roses which of the two ladies in front of him um, does the just see 
ought to have the power to deal with the body. That is the person who will then make the decisions. Um, now, the reason I spent so much time telling you about how to determine who has the power is because that is pretty much the answer to all of your disputes. Should the deceased be buried or cremated? The person with the duty has the power to decide. Where should the deceased be buried? The person with the duty has the power to decide. Unfortunately, you discover that full circle funerals are fully booked for the day you want to have your funeral. So you need to think the unthinkable and find an alternative funeral director. Who decides that? Who decides who to use? whether you wait until they're available. The person who has the duty to dispose of the body has the power to make the decision. What flowers should go in the coffin? When should the cremation take place? What hymns should you sing at the funeral, etc., etc.? That, again, is generally the person with the power. And I say generally because whilst a funeral itself is better described as a ceremony, an We could all just collectively cross our fingers and count to three and hope that Nikki starts talking to us again. That would be marvellous. <laughs> oh, she came oh. back last time when she froze, so... Um... Yeah, hopefully it's just a couple of seconds. She was telling us um, she's just had her internet provider changed and she's having some teething problems. So hopefully... She'll join us shortly. And otherwise, what we'll do is we will bar, oh. Oh, she's left the building completely now. So what I suggest we do, Julia, is if we um, head on to your section and then hopefully when Nikki joins us again, we'll come back um, and hope that she can pick up where she back. left off. Is that all right? I think she's back. She's back. Oh, back. she's back. back. Marvellous. We're about to implement plan B. Are you Excellent. okay to go? So we, you, yeah, we, yeah. Did go I get ahead. to next slide, please, and ashes? No, but should we do that? Where did I get to? Um, well, I don't know how far before that, because we don't know what you were going to say. What was the last thing I said? You were telling us that pretty much everything comes down to any question that you ask, pretty much comes down to who is the person who's got the power um, and the right to make decisions rather than the decision itself. Fine. And did I mention the funeral itself? You were coming on to that, I think. OK, so the funeral itself, better described as a ceremony rather than a duty in relation to a body, um, simply because you don't need a funeral um, to dispose of a body. Um, but the reality is that the two go hand in hand. And so the courts have generally considered that the person with the duty to dispose of the body also has the right to organise any funeral and their right to decide upon the mode and place for disposal of the body will only be interfered with if it is considered to be unreasonable. And before I hand over to Julia, I'll say next slide, please, and move on to ashes very briefly, um, because life would be far too easy and straightforward and lawyers would have nothing to do um, if all the laws and regulations hung together in a coherent fashion. Um, an application for cremation is made by way of prescribed forms by either an executor or an administrator or a near relative who is aged 16 or over. And next slide, please. A near relative is defined as a widow or widower or surviving civil partner, a parent or child or any other relative usually residing with the deceased. And you can make that application um, if you are that any other person, provided the medical referee is satisfied that you are a proper person to make that application. And an obvious example here is a cohabitee. Um, and the issue of who fills in the forms is very important because following cremation, next slide please, um, the cremation authority must either one, dispose of the ashes in accordance with the applicant's instructions or where no instructions or they're not collecting the quantum instructions, dispose by burying or scattering the same. So you can see that the person who becomes the applicant for the purposes of cremation is the first person who has control of the ashes and the person who is the applicant may not be the personal representation personal representative and may not be the person with the power of the body which of course can lead to disputes over who should actually have possession of the ashes before you even start about arguing what you're going to do with them once you've got them again 
that's a whole other subject, a whole other talk. And it's an interesting one because the courts have held that ashes are in fact property and therefore they can be owned unlike a body. Um, and therefore arguments there fall into the trusts category rather than the probate category. Um, but I said, I'm not dealing with it, but I do flag it up as a potential problem because if you are going to mediate and you are going to settle this, if you can deal with the ashes at the same time, it will save you an awful lot of trouble later on. And on that seamless link, I will hand you over to Julia, who hopefully has a more stable internet connection than I do. <laughs> I hope so. Um, right, thank you so much, Nikki. Um, yeah, so I'm not going to, I am a lawyer, but I'm not going to talk any law anymore. Um, so I'm a, a mediator and a conflict coach. Um, and um, I, deal with lots of disputes um, that cover these topics. Actually, interestingly, most of lots and lots of these types of cases, um, probate disputes, end up involving disputes about ashes. Um, and often the lawyers involved see there are sort of side issues, but often they can be really, really important. And um, often that does come up at mediation, as, as Nikki just said. Um, but today, I'm just going to um, give you a tell you a couple of stories actually from my work and then give you an overview of um, some of the options that there are out there. Um, preparing for this talk because it was rather difficult to know exactly what to talk about because there were so many different areas of this that I could have covered and there's clearly lots of different people in the audience today and just listening to uh, the few people who introduced themselves at the beginning um, I, it was really interesting to hear the things that you said which was that you want to know more about sort of the unsaid things I think Amanda said and complaints about services used um, and wanting to learn additional techniques. Um, so I was like, I think, goodness me, I'm afraid I haven't covered any of that in my talk. However, I will try to bring some of that in. And I think actually, probably we can cover it in the Q&A. Um, so I'm actually not going to talk for very long, because I think that the Q&A on this will be very interesting. I want to make sure that we, we leave time for that. Um, so without further ado, do if we could move on to the next slide please Sarah. Um, so I'm actually going to start with a story about ashes. Um, as I said this is something that I see very often disputes about ashes and this story uh, is a, a call I got one day from a London lawyer who contacted me to say that they had been contacted by a potential client who was thinking about going for an injunction. Um, and they basically just said to me, look, do you think you'd be able to, to talk to her because it, it doesn't seem like it's really an ideal case for an injunction. Um, it might be better for mediation. Um, and she passed me her contact details. So I spoke to the lady. She had um, lost her mother and she was in dispute with her mother's partner and one of her sisters. And it was the mother's partner and the sister who had um, instructed the funeral director in this case. There were two disputes um, at the heart of it. One of them was about who had authority to instruct the funeral director because it was an intestacy. And as Nikki just covered, um, there was just basically, I think in this case, the funeral director had taken um, instructions from the partner um, who technically didn't appear to have um, sort of the, the power to deal with um, the, the funeral. Um, and so she wasn't very happy about that element of it and the entitlement element of it. Um, but the real dispute seemed to be about what was going to happen to the ashes. Um, and when I spoke to her, she was just very upset about the fact that obviously she, she and not having any control over the, the arrangements for the funeral at all, um, potentially was not going to have any say in relation to what happened to the ashes and, and to not have any part of those ashes at all, which she was very upset about. Um, I, I had a, I listened to her a lot, we had a long chat, um, and I offered in this case to start by actually speaking to the funeral director, rather than actually trying to get in touch with the other family members, because often talking to the other family members is it's difficult to get all the family members to immediately agree to involve a neutral person such as a mediator or, or um, facilitator. Um, and so I said, I'd just start by talking to the funeral director, just to try to understand a little bit more about what was going on so that I can really understand the, the dispute. When I spoke to the funeral director, I have to say I was rather surprised at the tone um, and the, the, the person I spoke to, um, I, and he went on and on about 
this family and this person and that she and I felt like you know, this funeral director had really judged this lady. Um, I had already seen some email correspondence that had gone between the funeral director and this lady as well and I was again slightly surprised at the tone of some of that and I could see why we were where we were um, to be honest because um, mm -hmm. this lady wasn't being listened to um, and there was clearly a lot of her an awful lot of emotion and at the end of the day really <laughs> what she needed was somebody to just be really compassionate towards her and just listen to her and what she was really upset about, because she had been, the, the dispute, as I said, was about ashes. And she had been offered um, a keepsake urn with a small portion of the ashes in it. And she was very unhappy about that offer. She didn't think that the urn would be big enough. She didn't think it would be attractive enough. She didn't think it would really be appropriate um, way to remember her mother. Um, I asked a few questions to the funeral director about this urn. He told me a bit more about it, um, you know, showed me some pictures and, um, I then went back and spoke to the lady again and just said to her, look, I, I understand that you know, the keepsake urn is a really beautiful one. It's, and I told her how big it was. And I, I just sort of told her you know, a little bit more about it. And I hadn't been speaking very long when she just said, ah, it's just not worth it, is it? And it was a really incredible moment because you think a few days ago, she was just thinking of, she, she was so angry and upset that she'd gone as far as to contact an expensive London lawyer to talk about an injunction or in with a couple of conversations where I wasn't even formally instructed I was just trying to sort of work out a way that I could get involved to help I was able to just diffuse what was going on and actually just help her to understand that really what what she had been offered was okay and that I mean the funeral was only you know very very soon and there was just really no point in actually just taking the nuclear option of involving lawyers and I think I think you know the message from that story really is just often people just need to be listened to and they just need to speak to somebody who they don't view as somebody who's on somebody else's side speaking to a neutral person the power of that in a very short conversation can be quite incredible um and so, you know, I don't think I worked any particular magic on that day, but just by actually those lawyers made a really good call by saying, OK, let's just, just talk to somebody else and see, see what can happen. And I suspect there's lots and lots of cases like that. But um, I think really, you know, what, what's really needed um, is just that compassionate touch with somebody who just listens to somebody, listens to them actively, very carefully, and actually doesn't judge them. And doesn't sort of get involved at all in actually the rights and wrongs of the dispute and trying to sort of decide which family member is, is right and wrong. I'm sure the family funeral director in that those circumstances was absolutely doing their best. And I can totally see that you know it's a very difficult situation to find yourself in when you've got clients and who are arguing with family members who are arguing. Um, but I think really, you know, that it, it can often be diffused really quite quickly. Um, so um, we move on to the, the next slide, please. Um, so obviously that, that case I've just told you about was um, um, one where you know, there, was, there, were, there were no lawyers involved, but often there are cases which have gone on for quite a long time. Um, and um, I put aside mediation of funeral disputes, but really it's, it's, it's not just funeral disputes, that's probably the wrong term actually, because there could be so many different um, disputes that end up with, with lawyers being involved. Um, and often mediation is the best way to resolve those disputes. So, so if you're actually going down the route of a formal mediation, often litigation has been going on for, for quite some time. Um, sometimes, it, obviously, with the nature of these, it, it can, be, can not be going on for very long because, of course, these, these things are urgent often and they have to be resolved very quickly. Um, but uh, the parties would um, jointly independent, it, it appoint an independent mediator um, and that can be arranged very quickly and, and cheaply, especially these days with video conference being used increasingly for um, mediation. Um, so in, that, in mediation, the parties generally would be, um, in this kind of case, I would imagine would be in, in separate rooms. Um, but they may not be. Um, they can, you know, you can have everybody together in one room. 
um, if that is appropriate. But increasingly, I think people feel more and more comfortable in mediation um, where the parties are kept apart. And it's the mediator who shuttles between the parties, trying to understand um, the perspectives of the different parties. And, and the most important thing that the mediator do, is doing is um is listening Ooh, we've jumped to the q a <laughs> um we um we're not there quite yet um so it's, it's that listening technique really that is so important and so often what's at the heart of these disputes is just a party who's just not been heard not felt that they've been understood and there's so much pent-up emotion and because people don't know that, you know, they've never found themselves in this situation before. And when there's a lot of anger and when there's a lot of hurt and emotion, the natural thing often to do is to think, well, I'm going to contact a lawyer because I don't know what else to do. And as Nikki said, you know, there are some cases that are absolutely suitable for lawyers, but there are some cases that actually, when lawyers are involved, and certainly of this kind of case, it, it can make it worse if lawyers are involved or the wrong kind of lawyers are involved at the wrong time. Um, but you know, mediation is a, a very suitable way to try and resolve these disputes. So it's very flexible, it's very quick, it's very cost effective, and it means that you can resolve everything that is in dispute, everything that a court might not, you know, would not necessarily be able to, to resolve for you. So I'm just going to tell you a story about a case that I mediated um, recently which was a dispute which had actually been going on for four years since the person had died. And it was a dispute about ashes. Um, and I think lawyers had been involved for a, about three years, which is quite an astonishing length of time for a dispute of this nature. Um, it was a dispute between a widow um, and a mother. Um, the person involved had um, died unexpectedly and um, there were also two children who'd left behind two children, one of whom was, was autistic, quite severely autistic. Um, and the, the dispute had taken on a very difficult um, dynamic, um, partly because the, one of the, the autistic child had developed a really um, strong attachment to the ashes of his deceased father. And um, he had somehow become involved in the decision making of the uh, you know, of the dispute and he was aware of what was going on and he was quite young and the whole dynamic was just really really complicated um it eventually both parties agreed to mediate and um i got involved i had some initial conversations with the parties um, and i could immediately see a potential way through and we got together at mediation. There were lots of lawyers involved. There were barristers involved. And um, to be perfectly honest, what was really at the heart of the dispute was just actually that the whole relationship of trust had obviously completely broken down. And the parties just weren't hearing each other. But, but when, when things are reduced to writing in solicitors' letters, the message often just gets misinterpreted, misunderstood, and just completely lost. And, and it was an absolutely perfect case for mediation. It was a real shame that it took so long to actually get to mediation. But the way that the, the case actually settled was by me actually managing to get the widow and the mother in a room, a virtual room over Zoom on their own without the lawyers involved to actually talk to each other. And at the beginning of the mediation, they were just just didn't want to speak to each other at all. They were horrified at ever having any contact. Trust had completely broken down and they didn't um, even want to have each their email addresses shared or anything. Um, so it was, it was a really, really difficult, acrimonious dispute. And everything that was suggested by the other party, because it had come from the other party, was immediately dismissed out of hand as to what should happen to these ashes. So as soon as I got involved, I actually made a mediator proposal um, because I could just see that whatever was suggested was going to be rejected out of hand. I could see a way forward. I made a, a suggestion. I made it very clear that the suggestion was coming from me, not from the other party. Um, and actually, they were open to it. And when I managed to get them in a room together just to talk about it, it actually, they, they really reached agreement very, very quickly. What was also in that case they managed to reach agreement in relation to actually having contact um, resuming contact with the grandchildren because there'd been no contact with the grandchildren for a couple of years and all of this had got caught up in the dispute and 
and what was really sad about that case was the mediation had been proposed really early on and the firm involved had refused it right at the beginning um, and I'd read in the bundle um, a, a letter from the lawyer who said um, I don't know why you think that mediation is going to be suitable for this case. We've effectively been mediating this dispute for three years to no avail. And the only thing that has um, actually been achieved is, is a load of costs. And when I read that, I just had my head in my hands because I was just it just misunderstood what mediation actually is. Those lawyers were not mediating that dispute. They were absolutely you know, writing some very hurtful, very aggressive correspondence. And I think that, you know, certainly these cases have to be handled very, very carefully by lawyers. And if they're not, they can escalate and they can escalate to a place that just is very, very difficult for parties and the hurt just gets deeper and deeper. Um, but it was a perfect case for mediation and um, the parties walked away um, you know, feeling like they could really move on and they could actually just um, grieve the, the, you know, the, the deceased who the, the, often the that the grieving process is completely stopped when these cases go to um, litigation. Um, so just moving on to the next slide, please. Um, it's There's another way that doesn't necessarily have um, funeral, uh, sorry, so lawyers involved. And that is um, something that I call family conflict coaching. Now, um, this is where uh, an independent person gets involved to basically just help a family to reach agreement. Um, this is generally where there isn't actually a legal dispute that could technically be um, reduced into something that could be put in a court application or something like that. So um, this, is, this is very, very helpful to just get difficult conversations happening. So often the hurt goes so, so deep that people just feel that they can't actually just talk to one another and they need somebody to help, but it's not necessarily a lawyer. Um, and in these circumstances, then a, a mediator can step in. Um, it, they can, they're not necessarily mediating, they're just facilitating difficult conversations, or um, you could even actually sometimes just work one-on-one -on -one with somebody. Um, I sometimes do that in my capacity as a conflict coach, just to talk a little bit like I did to that lady in the first story that I told, where I just spoke to her and actually just by listening to her, I was able to really help her to just, you know, just diffuse the the hurt. Um, again, it can be done over video conference, it can be done in the separate rooms. Um, there's no need to be in the same room, but sometimes, as I told in that story just now about the mediation, actually that's getting people in the same room is what is needed. Um, and it's an incredible flexible, flexible process. It's very quick and, and, and very cost effective. Um, it's, it's a very unknown sort of option for people. I don't think that people really realize that, that this, this option is out there. Um, but I think sort of the message is really just if you are dealing with a family who are having these difficulties um, and ultimately there are people out there who can help. And you don't, as if you are listening to this talk and you are a funeral director, um, it doesn't necessarily have to be you stuck in the middle. You can suggest an independent person to help and it isn't necessarily that expensive. Um, so um, I think certainly... In terms of, I'm going to just quickly finish up with just someone said they don't to just get additional techniques. I mean, I could do a whole talk on that. Um, it, it is, you know, a very a big a big topic, and I'm sure lots of you have training in difficult conversations. And um, but I think that really just just never underestimate the the power of just listening, listening, not talking that much, not actually offering advice just just a lot of the time somebody just wants to be heard and listened to because they're just really hurting and and not and not judging um is is so so important um but you know I, as i said i could talk about this for a very long time um but really i think it's probably would be really helpful to just move on to um a q a now because i think there's probably lots of questions hopefully there's lots of questions that some of you have got things that we haven't necessarily covered and i think there have been a few questions put in the chat so um i think that's everything that i want to say i'm very happy just to sort of speak to anybody at any point about anything so you can always contact me and um, um I, our contact details are there in the chat so um Thank you, everybody, for listening. If we should we yeah. go back to the 
it. Fab, I was just going to give a 30 second pause in case anybody wants to write down your details, either of you, and then I'll stop sharing and um, might be people frantically scribbling down email addresses and, and phone numbers and things. But I will stop sharing now and I will also